1998, early in 1998, Angie and I realized we would be parents of our seventh child. And we had, or by this time, were parents of six children. And we had gotten the questions, are they all yours? We'd been commented to, oh, you must be very busy. And our favorite was, you do know where babies come from, don't you? <laughs> but we had a really delicate situation when we found out uh, where Angie was with child, with our seventh child, and that was that we needed to tell my mom. She needed to find out from us directly before it got through the grapevine. In a small town, much smaller than this town, uh, news traveled fast. And how it happens, how ladies in the church divined that another lady in the church was pregnant, I have never figured it out. But we knew that we needed to get to her just in respect. But at the same time, mom presented me with a problem because she thought once we had two children, that's great. They came out of the depression, and she thought two kids was enough. So when we had our third, it was kind of like a, okay. Then we kept adding. So now here's our seventh child coming. So we did the sensible thing. We invited her out for pizza. And we told her in a public place. <laughs> that way she had to behave. And so at that, that was in some ways my first entrance into managing my parent. Have you, have you ever been tried to be managed? Um, as, as a manage a parent? Well, that's what we had to do. But for me, there was an even a bigger issue when we found out Angie was with child again, uh, that we were going to be parents again. And this was, it was formed in the phrase of a question. Do you know how old we'll be when she's 18? Well, she had her 18th birthday on Tuesday. Look how old I am. <laughs> we made it. But back in the day, that just seemed like, Oh, how will we ever be able to manage this? Um, how can we possibly raise another child? And this was before I'd even done the research that even back then they told me that we would need $212,000 to raise Lonnie from infancy to 18 years of age. That's what the USDA said back then. I went back and did the research. According to the USDA, we need $212,000 to raise Lonnie from birth to age 18. Lonnie, how much of that $212,000 do you have in the bank account? Mm hmm. You know what the price is today for your child if, if they're born today? USDA says you'll need 200, and I love this part, $245,000. $340. I mean, they put the $340 in there. What happens if I'm short $340? Um, so you hear this often today. You hear this in, in, in quite a bit. We can't afford to have kids. It's, sorry to hear this, that kind of language. Because I can guarantee you we didn't have $212,000 just for Lonnie to raise her. Because we had six others to raise as well. So I did some math again. So according to the USDA, from 1985 until uh, this last year, Angie and I should have had about $1.3 million to raise our kids. Now, if you go back and add salaries up and all that stuff, I, I get where they're coming with some of this stuff. But really, it wasn't a money issue for me. In fact, one time we went to visit a family, some family friends who were homeschoolers. They had kids about our same age. I don't think Lonnie was even born yet. And it's mayhem. You know how kids get together and make mayhem? And so this, we're at this farmhouse with these folks, and they're just, kids are going crazy. They're having fun. All of a sudden, we hear something, you know, and our host said, well, I wonder what that is. You can't have nothing nice with kids. And that's stuck with us ever since. You know, if our kids do something, man, you can't have nothing nice with kids. But that's not true. Because really the money issue wasn't the issue. Um, it wasn't really the issue for me, and it certainly was not the issue for my wife. She is much more trusting of God for money and the issues of money than I am. It's been a wrestle my whole life in some ways to trust God for the money. But not for her. That's, that wasn't the issue for her very much. But it really wasn't that much for me. It, was, it came down to this. 
when we found out seventh child was coming, it was basically, how can we do this? It just seemed so, <gasps> how? So to help my doubts, in that same year, July of that year, 1998, on the morning of our anniversary, July 7th, I was sitting in my office space at uh, Faith Baptist Church where I was associate pastor. It was a morning, and in comes a senior pastor, and he, you know how you can tell when something's in the air, just by the way somebody walks? Well, it didn't seem quite right, so he walks, and he grabs a chair, and he sits right in front of my desk. And he informs me that I'm being let go, that I, my position's been eliminated, and uh, they'll give me a little bit of severance, and, uh, but I'm no longer going to be needed as an associate pastor at the church. So we have a seventh child on the way. The oldest is 13 years old, so they go down every two years, seven kids, you can do the math, and I don't have a job anymore. And so it was quite a shock. And Angie and I did the, what we thought was the most appropriate thing to do at that time. We celebrated our anniversary and we bought a washing machine. <laughs> and that washing machine is still working in our house. It's as old as Lonnie is. The Lord sometimes takes us into places where when we ask the question, how can we do this, he brings along, because he loves us, he brings along things to say, this is how you will do this. This is how, you, this, is how this will work. Trust me. But I was 40 years old, and I, I kept going on, do you know how old I'll be when she's 18? How can we do this? And that was the question that just kind of this floated in my, my being as to what to do. So I come back at you, why this, why now? Why, why bring such stories up? Why this, why now? Uh, for me, it's a moment of reflection, to look back with contemplation, meditation, that's what reflection is, to be able to say, how can we do this? Oh, yeah. I'll trust God. Simple, right? But eight years ago, yesterday, was my first day on the job, so to speak, here as pastor of Grace Bible Fellowship. So today is my anniversary Sunday. And that's kind of what motivated a little bit of this moment of reflection for me, desire to reflect back on what God has done for me in particular, but also what he's doing for us as, as well. And I can remember coming in. At that time, we used to be able to come in the church that way. And I came in that back door, had... Having been given a key by Laverne Olson, I now had a key to get into the building, and I got into the building, and I, I can still remember getting into the building. Nobody was here that, that morning when I got here. And what was the question that went through my mind? How can I do this? I was excited and scared. That's what I was. So... Just to again help me along the way, uh, a month later, I was installed as the pastor. That's a formal thing where you recognize the pastor. So I was here as a month, and, and then they, there's a formal installation service. On that installation service, right up here, simultaneous to me being installed as a pastor, they had another plate up here. It wasn't a collection plate. What was in there? Those, those of you remember it. A mortgage. And what did you do to it? You burned it. The day I was installed, this church burned its mortgage, debt-free. And since that time, because of the giving patterns and the, and the generosity within this church, we've been building up a supply of money to do what? Build on the back of that church, on the back of this building. So God is, I don't take credit for that. I don't. I, never, I don't know if I ever said, we need to build on the back of that church. That came really, it came from within the body of this, of this fellowship. That's been the beautiful thing for me, is the body said, we need to build on to this church. Building. Because what are we really building? The church, which is the people. That's why we can camp out for a while out of our mechanical room. Because the facilities are used, used for the church. It isn't the church. 
The other thing that God helped me confirm when, we walked, when I walked in that back door and was both excited and scared at the same time was uh, we were trying to sell a house in Iowa in the middle of a cornfield in 2008. What happened in 2008? I had, we, we, we had two realtors in George, Iowa. So we chose one and not the other one. And the other one showed up the same day we showed our house for the first time. Just imagine that. We have selected a realtor, Tim. Tim is showing the house, and this was neighbor, so Tim said, you guys can be there as well, which is not normal. So Angie and I are at our house, showing the house to neighbors who thought about buying it. Tim's there, showing it. And as Tim is leaving, the other realtor in town drives up our driveway. And he asks, basically, he's a, he's a very forthright kind of guy. Um, what's going on? Uh, well, Tim's showing our house. Awkward. Because I knew both of them. And uh, Ty was uh, a little bit offended, I think. And I said, Ty, we need to make a decision. And we went with Tim. Then he said this. Well, when you haven't sold your house in a year from now, you come see me. And I looked Ty straight in the eye and said, Ty, God is my realtor. And in November of that year, we sold our house. And the amazing thing for me was the day we closed on the house, those of you who know how this works, the day we closed on our house, the offer we put down in the house we're presently live in right now was accepted the same day. So again, how can I do this? How can we do what we're doing? And then another one, just another one, and, and this is, I'm reflecting, I'm going back, I'm contemplating, I'm looking back, because today's anniversary Sunday, for me, that's what I'm doing. Another confirmation for me was that two days before I needed to come up here in, in September of that year, so I could be here to be on the 1st of October, two days, I was without a car. I didn't have a car to drive up here. I, I can't remember what I was going to do. I had sights on a car, and it was not working. Two days, the guy called me back and said, hey, I found the title of this car. Why don't you come look at it? So I come look at it. As I'm driving out of the town, I see another car sitting in a parking lot, in a, a dealer's lot. It's a 1994 Geo Metro. <laughs> and it was instant love at first sight. <laughs> Three cylinders of awesome power. And I bought that car that day, and two days later, I drove it up here. And that car just died last month. And I had just bought a new replacement car two weeks before that. How can I do this? How can we do this? We trust God. And we keep looking for ways. I have confidence in coincidences because I know the one who controls them. Maybe that's all coincidental for some people. That just happens like that. I don't think so. We have, a, we have a heavenly Father who cares for us, who knows us. But our agenda does not trump his agenda. His agenda trumps ours, and we readily put ourselves into it, and we trust him for the outcomes, but we don't mix up the agendas. That's the problem that we usually get ourselves into. We mix up our agendas with his agendas. So we need ability to reflect on what God is, who he is, what he does, how he does it, and how he does it with us. So into the scriptures, I think God is built into a reflection as a way uh, reflection moments are actually built into the, into the faith, into the scriptures. And the, and the one that stands out the most in the Old Testament and has some application into the New Testament is the Sabbath day. The, the Sabbath day was a day set aside. It was a commandment to do rest and reflection. Those two things. No work, but don't be idle. In other words, don't be indolent. Don't just... Dis- lay around and have nothing. The, the Sabbath day had built into it, not just don't work, it had built into it, do something with this time that is God-centered, reflecting on what God has done. Two reasons were given for the Sabbath. One in Exodus was that God created all this. And on the, on the seventh day he rested, you rest like him. But just remember 
Remember who made this place, who controls this place, who sustains this place. God does. It's his creation. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because he kept it holy. He set it aside and said, remember. But the other thing that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is the other reason, and this came later on actually, this came after the Exodus, after the people came out of Egypt, and God said through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 5, remember the Sabbath day to reflect. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an uplifted arm. Remember. So reflect. Remember where you came from and what God has done for you. So reflection is actually built into the scriptures to do this. We're, we are to reflect upon where we're at and how we got here. And answer that kind of question, because it's still there. It's still, it still floats around in my mind many times. How can I do this? How can we do this? And it's the same answer. I keep getting the same answer back again. Trust me. By faith. The righteous shall live by faith. What's the operative thing in faith? Faith. Not faith in faith, but faith in the God who says, do these things and I will be in them. So the second way of reflection that the scripture gives, and I invite you, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to take a little, little bit of look here. And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want to look a little bit at the second way that God gives us to reflect on life of faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And how, how do we reflect? How, how, do we, how do we come at this? And you'll see this pretty quickly that, that Paul ties it back into that into the Exodus, and he ties it back into the people coming out of Egypt, what the people of Israel are supposed to remember. So let me just take a look at this real quick. First Corinthians chapter 10, and trying to do the proper exposition here, because he, he begins verse 1, he says, for I do not want you to be unaware. Well, that tells you right away that there's something that came just before this that we should probably look at. So let me look at that with you as well. Back up into chapter 9, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 24. Over these last few weeks, I've, I've, I've wanted to put a little tension in our, in our lives a little bit because there are warnings within the Scripture. There are um, things that we should, we should never coast through our, our belief in Jesus. We should never just kind of lay back and I don't have anything to do. That's how people get in trouble. And so Paul is in one of those places where he's going to give a little bit of a warning but he also talks about himself. He reflects. In verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now, I've heard athletes use this out of context. You know, I get it. Athletic competitions are really kind of neat in some ways. But this is in the faith context as followers of Jesus Christ. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not be in the air. But I discipline my body, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Do you think there were some things in the Apostle Paul that kept him motivated, that there were some warnings that he was heeding in his, in his faith in the Lord himself? Absolutely. He wasn't Superman who could make no mistakes. Neither am I, neither are you. That's not the faith. The faith is a fight. The faith is, we live the faith out in the bodies that we have here. And this body is not, and, I'm, and I know I'm, I'm using some language that Scripture talks about. It's not just this physical body, yet what does this physical body have? What's, it, what's its function? It's to maintain and hold on to what is my soul, my spirit, your spirit. It's the shell, you could say. But in that mixture of the physical body and our soul, that's where we still have to fight the fight of faith. That's where we have to make sure that we're, we've got our eyes fixed on the right things, pursuing, going the right direction. Because if we don't, the body and, and its way in which it 
you know, works with our soul, the body has ways of taking us away. Now you can see this if you want, if you want to really have some fun, take this afternoon, if you want some reflection, just sit down, read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 in sequence. Take your time, but you'll see this. You'll see this fight that goes on with what Paul calls our flesh and the body and our spirit. That's where it's at. But Paul says, he's practicing this. He's saying, I discipline my body, make it my slave, so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And that's something that, that hits me as a pastor as well. I'm enjoined by scripture that not many of you should be teachers, because you will incur a greater judgment. So I believe in a living God and a living Lord before whom I will stand someday, and I must give an account for what I'm doing with you right now and over the last eight years with you and the eight years before that with another church and the year two or three or four or five years before that with another church. And I've always been involved in some way of teaching within the church for the most part. Paul says the same thing. I don't want to get to the end and go, uh, who cares? Then he goes on into what we know as verse, or chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The historical event he's talking about here is Israel coming through the Exodus, through, out of Egypt, into the Promised Land. And of course, it's a more complicated story than that, but he disabbreviates it here. And all were baptized into Moses, identify with Moses in the cloud, which is the cloud that followed them at night. At night, what did it look like? Torch. In the daytime, it was like the fog, I think, that I, I drove to church in this morning. You know, it was beautiful yesterday. When I left church yesterday, there was a bank of fog that started right here, went across the bay. As I was driving home, there was sunshine. As I got into Ashland, there was sunshine. But as I drove by one of the bridges, it's just like this cloud right across the bay from here to there. That's, that's kind of what the picture that we see. We don't exactly know what this cloud looked like, but it was obvious there was a presence there. You couldn't miss it. And could you miss walking through a body of water with walls of water on both sides of you? Could you actually miss that? What would, you, would you remember that you walked through a sea that both walls of water were on the side of you and you walked on dry land through it? Wouldn't you kind of remember that? All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. This is fascinating. This is beautiful. This is true. And the rock was Christ. This is, this is referring back to the Old Testament. Whose presence was with Israel as they came out of Egypt and headed towards the promised land? God's presence was with them. The Messiah's presence was with them. Verse 5, here's where the warnings come in. And this is what I've been trying to talk about over the last few weeks. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness because of their disobedience. And we see a list of those here. So then Paul says, Now these things happen as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things like they also craved evil things. Now, if you crave ice cream, fine. But there are other things that your body might crave. God would say, get away from them. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So again I say to you, Grace Bible Fellowship, those of you that call this home and those of you that are visiting today, you're underneath there too if you want to be. We must be disciples of Jesus Christ here now, in this place, at this time, with whatever's happening around us. And this is where we can, in obedience, do that very thing. But we need to heed warnings like this. Because there's all kinds of preaching happening around outside us. There's all kinds of appeals in our lives, things that we think will make us happy and satisfy us, that are not God-pleasing. So last week I challenged you about if you're a Games of Thrones watcher, I don't think you should be watching Games of Thrones. There's a lot of stuff in media today you as a believer in Jesus Christ should not open your, you should not open your eye gates to. 
you should, you should get away from it. There are things you should avoid because they're not going to help you. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. It's really easy to convince ourselves that I'm okay. I can do this. I know it's probably not the best. And, we'll, and Paul actually goes to that line of thinking later on in this chapter. Not everything that is permissible is profitable to us. Not everything that's permissible is good for us. There are lines to stay in for our benefit. And I'm not going to take time to go through all the, the different idolatry, immorality, uh, try the Lord. Um, I just know that in, our, in, this, in this day and age, the way that the world has presented itself to the church of Jesus Christ is it's been this wooing that, oh, this isn't bad. This is, this is not bad stuff. Don't worry about it. You can't, you can't hurt yourself doing these things. And as Christians, as who want, those who want to follow the Lord, there are many temptations in this life. And he says that. No temptation is overtaking, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, this is important, will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. And he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Is anything else other than a commitment to Jesus Christ and God the Father, if we, if we divide our loyalties like Lot divided his loyalties, like last week we talked about, we divide our loyalties, if we try to play the middle ground, it'll give out underneath us. We can't play the middle ground. We need to keep our focus on this person, Jesus Christ, and follow him faithfully. But Paul then goes on, and this is where I'm coming back to this moment of reflection, because there's two places, two major things that God gave for reflection time, to look back and go, look what God has done when we have said, how can I do this? And the second one is when we come to a communion table like this. This may look like a simple thing. In fact, um, it becomes, in some ways, it can become just kind of a habitual practice that, well, it's the first Sunday in each month, and we do communion together, and, oh, what's a football score? But this is what Jesus gave us. Now, I'm sure it, it didn't shine like this. I'm sure communion did not look like this, and there's freedom within that. He didn't, he didn't tell us exactly how to do it, but he told us what was involved with it. Two things were involved with it. A cup and bread. Way to remember what has been done for us. He goes on, Paul does, verse 15, I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Say it to you as well. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. What kind of world do we live in? What kind of world do we live in? supernatural world. There is a spiritual element to our world. There's strong voices outside of us that say, this is only a natural world. These kinds of things do not happen. But we recognize they do. Because it is a fallen world. A fallen spiritual world. And so here Paul says, there are people who participate, probably most of the time, unknowingly, giving allegiance to demons. And not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than him, are we? This is, this is apostolic logic. This is Paul's logic. To say to us, remember what you're doing here. Reflect on this. The greatest enemy that you face in life is not another person outside yourself. The greatest enemy you face in your own life is that, that fallenness, your sinful heart, that draws you away from God, that takes you away. When you think you will be fulfilled by something other than the Creator God and the Son that He sent and the Holy Spirit, that's your greatest enemy. Sin 
which is not a nice word anymore, it's a hate speech word these days, sin is our greatest enemy. And God sent his son, Jesus, to take sin, our sin, Keith's sin, Dan's sin, Aaron's sin, as we trust him, he took that sin upon himself at the cross. And he suffered the punishment that we deserved. He took the heat, you could say, for what we should have taken. But now Paul, if he saw this, in the, what he was, as he was talking about this, he was speaking to the church and he would speak to us as well. Believers in Jesus, don't be like the Old Testament people who saw all these wonderful things and did they stick with God or did they, find, they thought there was something better? They thought there was something better. So they walk through the water, they see the presence of the cloud, and they start dreaming of leeks and onions in Egypt and saying, we had much better food there. Moses, take us back. That's what I speak to us as Christians today. Be careful. You don't try to change the menu up for what God has provided. This is his menu. This is the main dish. Out of this flows everything else. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And with him, I can do what he's called me to do. With him, we can do what he's called us to do. We can be his disciples here now in this place. Amen? So what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to use the, what he's given us here today to keep a focus, to reflect upon the most important thing that's ever happened on this planet. That God sent his son, his only begotten son, for he so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And coming into that life changes everything. But it needs to keep on changing everything. Let's not back up into the world again. Into the lies that are out there. That there's something better than Christ. There is nothing better than Christ. So if you're a visitor here today and you know Christ is your Savior, we invite you to take communion with us. If you don't, if this is not something that's part of your world, I would just ask you to refrain. Nobody will look down on you for not taking communion. We do it this way here at Grace Bible Fellowship. We come up and we take a piece of the bread. If there's some cut up here or you can tear off a piece here. And we take that to ourselves because he died for individuals. But at the same time, he put something together so that he would take a bunch of us individuals. And the way I like to do it is, he took a bunch of me's and he flipped the, the, the M over. And if you flip the M over, what do you got? We. He changed a bunch of me thinking people to we thinking people, the church. We are his people. And together we keep on following him into what he's called us to do as a church. So then you take the cup and you hold that and have a seat and then we'll take that together. So take the bread to yourself. Then to sit down, and we'll take the cup together. Let me pray. What a joy, Lord, to be here on this Sunday, eight years removed from coming here. I love this church. I love the people of this church. It hasn't always been easy, and I'm sure I haven't always been easy. But, Lord, you've called us out to be your people. May we faithfully be your disciples here, now, in this time, in this place. And we thank you that it all comes out of this, Lord Jesus, that you loved us, gave your life for us. It is your life in us that makes us alive. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And apart from you, we really don't live at all. Lord, we are asking that you might use us as, uh, as your disciples to show the light to people that they might come out of darkness and into light and receive unto themselves the very life you've promised. Lord, I'm praying for transformed lives. And that, Lord, the lives that are, are believers here, that we will be careful, that we will separate ourselves from the things that draw us away from you. And we will honor you, love you wholeheartedly. So I thank you for this time. I thank you for what you've given us in the community to remember, Lord Jesus, what you've done for us. For it's in your name we pray this. Amen. <laughs>